Boom. So, hey guys, we are testing the last few bits and we will start. Uh, dziękuję bardzo. Będę mówić po angielsku, to będzie troszeczkę wygodniej dla mnie. Po polsku ja wszystko rozumiem. Jeśli wy macie jakieś pytania, to, to w porządku. Uh, all right, my name is Gleb Alexandrov. I run the Creative Shrimp blog with tips and tricks about computer graphics, art, coffee brewing. We have a wonderful picture over there. We have Blender 2.81, I believe. That's one of the daily builds. You can download it at blender.org as usual. And that is daily build in the sense that it's, well, daily, that each day Blender gets a little bit better, hopefully. Uh, sometimes uh, new patches just break Blender, but generally it becomes better. And it becomes better for volumetric rendering as well, and that's what we are deeply interested in. And uh, in this real-time tutorial, if you wish, I will try to show you guys a few methods of creating 3D nebulae in Blender, something like that. It's pretty much volume shader, uh, visualized in Blender, and uh, nothing special, but that is so awesome if you want to create something like, say, volumetric nebulae, gas clouds, and other galactical objects. And uh, now let me find my presentation, and we will start the ball rolling. Uh, throughout the presentation, I'll be using Cycles, the good old ray tracing engine of Blender, but we also have uh, right now experimental, or the rather newly added to Blender Eevee render engine, which allows to render stuff like volumetric clouds in real time, but uh, today we're going to be using Cycles more often. All right, so my name is Gleb. We run the Creative Stream blog, and uh, by show of hands, how many of you guys have actually heard about Creative Shrimp? All righty then, awesome. So we do computer graphics, here is our jingle. One, two, three, four. With coffee and, and some and presentations in 3D. Started with a blimp, it's Creative Shrimp. Here's our mascot, a duck. And this is me, this is Aidy, and we are deeply interested in space, mainly because space is awesome, but also because we released this Space VFX course at the beginning of 2017, and it went pretty well. Uh, it got very good feedback, but one thing that was missing was volumetric clouds. Uh, I mean real volumetric clouds, not the various hacks like stacking 2D planes that we used before to create the illusion of depth because in the end it was just an illusion and if you rotated the camera the illusion fell apart and since then we've been wanting to play with the same toys as other folks who use proprietary software like uh, real real volumetric objects millions and billions of particles as you can see in the works created in 3ds Max and Krakatoa, uh, which Krakatoa is a uh, render engine specially meant for rendering massive amounts of particles. So we wanted to have that in Blender. So, but, by, but traditionally this area of computer graphics was totally dominated by proprietary software and for good reason, because yeah, that's pretty complex stuff. And uh, what I'm talking about is this kind of this kind of artworks uh, by Tion van der Zalm, Vyacoslav Pozavac, Martin Mirola, Parallel Digital and other amazing artists. Um, actually, this is, I believe, this is 3ds Max and Krakatoa, but also Houdini. And we wanted to have something like that in Blender. So how could we compete? At the Blender conference in Amsterdam, um, we talked about the progress with volumetric rendering and how the community helps to make that happen uh, by funding Blender development, uh, but most importantly by sharing ideas and bouncing ideas off each other, just talking on Twitter, sharing work, 
sharing blend files. And today I want to uh, talk about a few methods of creating 3D nebulae, such as procedural patterns, smoke simulation, particles, point density, and if we will have some time, we will also talk about EV and a little bit about distributed rendering. So let's start with the procedural patterns. Here are a few works, like um, a, a bunch of demos created by our small creative shrimp team in Cycles. And basically, this is kind of a quality you, you, you can expect from a Blender today. <laughs> Uh, if you download daily build, you will be able to create something like that, no problem whatsoever. And a few years ago, it was unthinkable. Not only because Blender uh, wasn't up to this task, but mainly because there wasn't like knowledge needed to create this thing uh, within the community. And now, thanks to all the tutorials and all the information uh, that we collectively created, like this is completely real and uh, procedural patterns are like generators of anything in Blender. This is pure math visualized. Uh, for example, standard Blender noise, also called Perlin noise, is, uh, is practically, uh, it practically can give you an infinite level of detail. As you zoom in really close into the cloud, it reveals more and more details. So that's what I love about procedural noises. Um, that is one of the techniques uh, that can be used to create nebulae and other galactical looking objects. Uh, just to give you a, a, a short rundown of how it looks like, here you have a cube of volume light, and you can use 3D textures, like the Blender noise texture, to control the strength or the density of that light. And if you want to make it a little bit more detailed, you combine a few noises together, and after you colorize it, uh, it looks almost like uh, an emission nebula. I wonder if you agree with me. It looks awesome. And the next step would be to recombine it with the volume shader. Because, yeah, previously it was emission shader, but if we plug the same stuff into the volume shader, you get uh, physically correct properties like light scatter, absorption, anisotropy, and other sweet, sweet stuff. And that is uh, the principled volume shader, which is based on the Disney shader. Um, that was added by Brecht van Lommel to Blender. So now we can play with this shader and uh, try these three-dimensional textures plugged into the density socket. And thanks to Omar Imara, who added the four dimension to Blender noises, we can also play with the evolution of this noise pattern in time. Because now all the, all right, not all, but I think the standard Blender noise and some other noises work in four dimensions, which is mind blowing. And uh, I, I would like to show something like that right now in Blender. So first of all, I will open the template, uh, which is nothing more than a standard, say, Blender file with a few settings that I modified. First of all, I switched over to GPU instead of CPU, because even though I'm working right now on pretty weak laptop, the GPU on this laptop is still stronger than CPU in terms of rendering in terms of path tracing. So yeah, it's GPU rendering and in the volume tab, uh, the standard, uh, the default setting for max step size is 0 0.1, I believe, but I cranked it up to one uh, just uh, to, to get ourselves a little bit of performance boost. All right, and the max steps, I believe by default, it's 2048, something like that. So let's set it way down just so we can render this stuff in real time without, without massive lagging. And then we will switch over to the cycles rendered mode. And here we have the emission shader, which goes into the volume of the material. That is very important because we're going to be dealing with volumes. But for the moment, I will reconnect it to the surface input like this. So this is just cube, all right, <laughs> with the emission uh, shader, nothing special. And uh, we will be using procedural noises. If you go Shift A texture, you will notice a bunch of textures. We won't be using photos or images. We will be using procedural noises, which is math. All right. So, for example, Voronoi texture, and you can 
combine it, uh, or rather you can pl plug it into the strength of the emission shader, and you will notice right away that we rendered a bunch of dots, and we can control the scale and randomness of these dots. These are, this is purely procedural stuff. We can zoom in really closely like that, or after the noise, we can add the color ramp to boost the contrast. So we can adjust the look of these dots or whatever. And uh, oh, But actually, what is interesting is that we can plug it into the volume of the material, and we will get something like that. Um, that is the basis of our 3D enablers, pretty much. I will replace Voronoi texture with the noise texture right now, because in my opinion, it looks very natural and very astronomical. Uh, it kind of produced cloud-like patterns as soon as you as soon as you combine it with the volume shader or with the emission shader. But the point is that you work with the volume input of the material. Uh, in, the, in the noise texture, you have a bunch of options to tweak. For example, scale, which is pretty self-explanatory. You can make the pattern bigger or smaller. Uh, and we have also detail, which is... Uh, but first, let me crank up the contrast like that so we can see uh, what it does. So the detail uh, set to zero practically means that our cloud, our pattern will be almost like cartoonish, uh, not very realistic at all. But as soon as we crank up the detail, we can see that we can add additional, additional details, wisps of smoke, additional octaves of the noise. Usually uh, I try to keep it pretty low, like five, because as you go higher, Blender becomes slower. That it works like this. You need to find the right balance. And lastly, we have distortion. This is like distorting this noise by the copy of itself, something like that, uh, for additional turbulence. But I won't be using it right now. So let's set it to zero. Actually, what I'll be using instead is the vector input of the material. So each texture has a vector input, and we can use it to distort this texture with some other texture. So I will just duplicate the noise and uh, hook it up over there. And immediately you can see that now we have like twice as complex noise. And that's the basics of how we approach Nebulae. We create complex noises based on the procedural textures of Blender. This is a very fruitful approach. And also we have this switch that is, we can change it to two-dimensional noise, which is not very practical in our case, uh, three-dimensional or even four-dimensional. And in four dimensions, we will be able to control something like, say, evolution of the noise with this W. Whoa. Something like that. But it's also slower than 3D versions, so I will stick to 3D for the time being. All right, so let's plug this noise into that one, and um, we can go a step further and actually try to affect the scale as well. So, um, but I will add map range node to map the values of the first textures to some range. For example, black and white values will go from, say, from one to six. And so now we affect the scale of the second uh, procedural texture with the first one. And what I will do next is add the color ramp or maybe RGB curves this time. So it's like a standard, standard node like in Photoshop. You can control the contrast. So I will crush it like this and maybe add a little bit of a, a, little bit of a curve over there just to, to make it look more detailed. And it's a matter of trial and error. Uh, it's not very easy to visualize that in your brain, but after you tweak it a little bit, you will, you will begin to understand how it affects the final look. And here we have the color ramp, which is like the final contrast, the final tweak that we can do. And I think that looks already pretty neat. What we can do now is uh, set the color of the environment to black, to simulate space. And I will disable overlays so we can get a clear view on what we're actually doing. So this is basically a mission shader. This is basically the volume light. 
and we control the strength of this light by utilizing uh, the three-dimensional textures. The keyword is three-dimensional. And probably what uh, I will do next is copy the color ramp. And we have the color socket over there. We can use another color ramp to colorize what we've done. So, whoop, something like that. And let's go from black to maybe some, some red, some shade of red, something like that, and bluish color over there. And yeah, so we can colorize our noise this way. It's not very elaborate because we lowered the render settings, but also because we can use the volume shader instead. Emission is just emission. It doesn't ha have uh, like physically correct properties like absorption, scattering, and so on. We can replace it with the volume shader and see how it works. But first, I will save the Blender file because you never know what, what is going to happen. So Blender, oh, uh, come on, Blender day. 0, 0.5, something like that. And I will delete the emission shader and I will add the volume shader instead, which can be found under shader principled volume. Here we go. And the color go goes into color and the strength goes into density. And this goes into the volume input of the material or rather output. Okay, so now we have something like that, and uh, right away you can see that it reacts to the light. We have the light source, which is the point light. We can move it around and see how, how this cube filled with uh, gas reacts to the light. And this is already pretty exciting. We can clearly see that it's a cube, uh, but it's meant for testing. Once you're satisfied with the result, you can, for example, add displacement and extend the cube. And it works, it works like this. So you can practically extend it to whatever dimensions you like. Uh, but what I usually like to do is test it on a small sample, because this way you get the highest quality due to the sampling algorithm in Blender. And the cube can also look very neat, believe me. So uh, right now I will probably would like to multiply the density because I have an impression but, uh, that um, our noise is, uh, can be a little bit thicker. You know, because it transmits uh, too much light for my taste. So I will add converter math node. This node is meant uh, for mathematical operations, as its name implies. So we can, for example, we can add some value to it, but that's uniform. That's not very interesting. Let's actually multiply. And I will multiply it by five or by 55 for that matter. And by the way, uh, can you see everything clearly? Like the contrast is all right. Okay, I'm, I can make it brighter if you wish. So yeah, we multiplied uh, the density of the noise by five. And now we need to crank up the render settings a little bit because uh, are the, the high step size and the max steps that is just 64, it all limits our capabilities of high quality rendering. So let's, but first I will render it out so we not forget how it looks. 50% of the resolution. Um, I think we can set samples to something like 32 and hit render. And you can notice that even on laptop with a not very powerful video card, in, it takes seconds to render. And don't be afraid if you will see that, that it's noisy as hell, because you can use denoising in Blender. And Blender 2.81 and above have um, Intel Open Image Denoise, which is based on artificial intelligence and um, deep learning algorithms and that sort of stuff. So let me head over to the compositor to show how it works really briefly. So here is the compositor and here is very noisy image indeed. We can go denoise and drop it over there and it will remove the noise. All right, at the cost of extra blurriness, but if you have striked uh, the right balance 
of samples and render time, you can definitely live with that. So here's how it looks with denoising and without denoising. And uh, yeah. afterwards, you can add something like glare, because denoising doesn't mangle the data. And yeah, you have the glare. Just let me lower the threshold so we can actually see it. Boom. Look at these beautiful streaks. OK, so here is uh, render slot number one. I will switch to the second slot and crank up the render settings. It was one. Let's set it to 0 0.1 and 128, something like that. So it should become much thicker. And maybe let's uh, go to the material settings and increase it furthermore. Uh, let me see where the light source is. I will try to hide it in the cloud. Like that for some interesting uh, separation between light and dark areas. And if we don't like how, uh, how this noise works, we can actually alter the coordinates of the noise. The first texture that I use here, we can press Ctrl T uh, to bring up the mapping. And we can slide it. Slide it on X, on Y, on Z. We can alter the coordinates of the noise. And lastly, we can, of course, increase or decrease the contrast and see how, the, how it works for us. So I think that, that looks pretty cool. You can see the boundaries of the cube, which is not very cool. But anyway, the shading looks great. Let's render it out. Do, 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 do. Hopefully, it will take just a few seconds. And here you can see the effects of the additional uh, step size, or I should have said the lower step size. This is how it works. Uh, you, you create procedural noise uh, daisy chain by combining a few noises together, and then you plug it into the volume shader, which goes into the volume output of the material. You create something like that, which is fully volumetric, um, which allows you to zoom really closely because noise texture has uh, this built-in infinite details. So even ev if you constrain the render region to something like that and you zoom in really closely, you will see the, that the details are there. And you can constrain it furthermore, like this. And maybe if you go to the material setting, you can boost the detail to something like 12. And that will hopefully allow you to uh, create wonderful fly-through animations. Or, or you can just simply uh, set the render resolution to some insane 4K and let it render overnight. You will get a beautiful image indeed. Uh, I would like to show you a bunch of blend files for the procedural rendering techniques. Because uh, just uh, slight tweaks that you do to the noise itself or to the mathematical operations in between the noise and the volume shader, uh, it, it gives you like enormous flexibility uh, to create anything you want. Sometimes it's pretty hard to control, but yeah, this is the same setup with slightly different settings. You can see that the character of noise changed, that the style of noise changed in a very interesting way. Or here's the other example. It's the same kind of thing, but with three no noises instead of two. I think it looks gorgeous, especially when you set the render resolution very high for the final render. It's really a delight to watch how, how mathematics is visualized to produce something like that. And we can do it in Blender, like no problem. You can download the latest version. And we have shared a bunch of blend files on our Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Gleb Alexandrov, or just use B3D hashtag for Twitter, or B3D Nebula, something like that. We share the bunch of blend files uh, that, that you can see, and that you can reverse engineer. And yeah, this is slightly different type of the noise, but this is still the Blender default noise. So it's very versatile. And here I'm using a custom build, but anyway, it will work in any build of Blender. And lastly, I will show uh, this, this scene number, number five. 
this is nothing special, but for some reason I like it. It's just a fortunate combination of, of, of noises and how they are combined. All right, so this is procedural noise, but we also have a uh, few more techniques of working with nebulae in Blender, such as, for example, smoke simulation. Um, this is not as exciting, I would say, as procedural noise, uh, but this is definitely how how the guys in other 3D um, content creation suits do it. For example, in Houdini and so on, smoke simulation is a very popular technique of creating um, creating nebulae. So this is from the tutorials by Yago Mota. Have you guys watched the tutorials by Yago Mota on YouTube? Yeah, one hand. <laughs> Too. Very well. I recommend it a lot. If you're interested in uh, smoke simulation, in particles, and physical forces, and how it all combines together, I, I definitely recommend watching Yagamoto's tutorials. They're awesome. We're, we're able to familiarize ourselves with this side of Blender uh, very quickly. So uh, this is a bunch of uh, our demos that we created for the, the Blender conference, I guess. Um, you can see that the, the big shapes look all right, but the problem with smoke simulation is that it's very hard to push it over a certain threshold in terms of tiny, like, uh, fine grain, like details, wisps of smoke and that kind of thing that you take for granted with procedural textures. But it's very interesting nevertheless, and uh, I, I'll try to show you how it works. Uh, but first, like, to make it work really well, we, we would need something like volume displacement, like we have in Arnold Renderer, and I heard that Blender developers are interested in adding that to Blender, and actually uh, it, it may become a reality a pr um, pretty soon, if we are lucky. But regarding the smoke simulation, uh, the basics of the smoke simulation actually is very, very simple. First, you click on the default cube, press space to search, and you go quick smoke, and you get something that looks <laughs> like this. So that's a basic smoke simulation, congrats. And then we can lower the size of the cube, something like that, and in, in, in the smoke settings, uh, we can turn down the temperature difference to make sure that the smoke stays in place, like that. Ooh, we can paint with it. And then we can go to the smoke domain settings and set uh, the viewport density to something like 55, I mean thickness. And what else do we have to set? The resolution by default it's pretty low, we can crank it up like no problem whatsoever, so we get more detailed smoke. But actually, to, uh, to create something that looks remotely like nebula, we need uh, to apply physical forces. And you can find it under Shift-A menu, force field. We, here we have a bunch of things that I'm sure Piotr is very excited about. We have magnetic, harmonic, charge, uh, whatever you wish, Leonard Jones, whatever it is. That, yeah. You will explain that to me later on. Uh, but we'll, we'll be using turbulence field, which is just turbulence. And let me play it out. And you will see, I actually, yeah, even in uh, this resolution of 128, it became pretty slow. So, uh, but uh, I will stick to it for a moment, and I will increase the strength of the force fields, let's say to nine, size to one flow to two, just a random set of parameters, and hopefully we will see that the force field will make the smoke take interesting shape over time. If we um, play for like 100 frames, maybe it will uh, create something interesting. And it's a matter of tweaking settings, going back and forth. It's pretty unpredictable process. But actually, yes, even with with this set of random parameters, we get something that looks like explosion, maybe, or that's uh, yeah, that's more interesting just than just a cube filled with volumetric gas. Uh, we can work with that. Uh, now we can uh, select cycles as our render engine, and 
yeah, we created like rudimentary gas cloud. We can disable the visibility of the queue because we don't really need to see it in viewport, something like that. And from here, you can go and add more physical forces. But the problem is uh, that you cannot push over the certain threshold without going very high in terms of um, in terms of smoke resolution. And that will mean that even 10 seconds of simulation will probably take gigabytes or terabytes of data on your hard drive. No joke. And uh, this may become problematic very fast. Uh, that's why... Um, and we cannot displace the results or distort it somehow yet. But as I've said, the developers of Blender gave us a clue that um, actually that may happen soon. Or maybe we can code it ourselves somehow. Or maybe you can do it because, yeah, anyone can add a patch to Blender. And if you're lucky enough, if you're persistent enough, it will get into the master version of Blender one day. So we will all benefit from, say, the better smoke simulation or something like that. Uh, th that's a pretty interesting method of creating nebulae, but it has its own flaws. It looks looks pretty interesting, especially when you when you smuggle in a few light sources in the cloud like that, and you can play with the shader. And uh, but you can see that it's pretty low res in this example. Yeah, and if we go high resolution, we can simply go and drink coffee because it it will go forever. And one interesting thing about smoke simulation that it can actually control particles. And let's see how it works. First, you run the smoke simulation, and then you add the particle system, and you tell particle system to conform to the smoke sim uh, by using the smoke flow force. Because among other forces, like turbulence and so on, so on uh, you have the smoke flow force, and it can make particles stick to the fluid of the smoke or something like that. Let me set the viewport color to white so we can actually see what's going on. And I will set the timeline to zero. Here is a cube which spawns particles. And in this scene, we also have the smoke simulation, which goes like this. All right. So we spawn particles and we add the smoke flow force, which can be found under force fields, smoke flow. And what happens next is actually pretty exciting. Let's just look at this. What happens next is that particles start following the smoke. And while this is not uh, Star Trek end credits style uh, particle simulation, uh, not even close to what uh, folks who use Krakatoa usually do. Um, but this is something about 100,000 particles, not a lot. Actually, Blender became faster with processing particles with uh, Blender 2.81, I believe. We can, we can actually make it work. So it follows the smoke. It looks pretty neat. You can visualize it uh, using various shaders for various different effects. So for example, let me disable the visibility. And actually, and we see nothing because I have to change the Blender build over there. But thankfully, it takes seconds to launch. That is one unfair advantage of using Blender over other 3D softwares because you can, you can do it on the fly. You can close Blender and open it in one, two, come on, <laughs> three, come on. And it will crash on me. No. Actually, woo! We did it! <laughs> Very nice. I, uh, for a moment, I was afraid that it will crash. Like 3D's Max with that dreadful error, you know? Okay, so let's open the particles file. Actually, let me first find it somewhere on my computer. Spoiler alert. Blender Day Sings. All right. So here we have it particles. And you can render these particles. Here I just added uh, an emissive object and colorized it based on the particle's velocity, something like that. You can see that um, you don't have enough particles to make it look like a continuous object, like a solid or rather like a volumetric gas cloud. Let me render it out to prove the point. So you can see the individual 
tiny, uh, not even cubes, because cubes have six faces. This is like a cone with three fa faces, like the minimum you can have for this solid object. But the trick that we can use uh, is actually to enable motion blur, like in photography, yeah, uh, to make the inherent mo motion within the particle cloud affect the look of the cloud uh, on render. So I will switch to the render slot number three, hit F12, and we will notice that now the particles are like smeared and blurred according to their motion vectors, which looks a little bit like hair right now, but we can play with this effect to our advantage um, and use various different techniques to create the impression that there are more particles on screen than there actually were. And when combined with smoke, it can actually allow us to boost the details a little bit. So that's simply, that's interesting technique. Let's compare it with the previous render. Uh, it's much more continuous, I would say. And let me open the presentation right, no, right now and show you the, uh, the thing that Gottfried Hoffman created, and that is, that is wonderful. He, he wrote a script that actually freezes time in Blender. So we can have motion blur and we can fly around the static nebula, which shows motion blur. It's pretty hard to wrap our heads around it, how it actually works. But it works, it looks wonderful. I think we can poke Godf uh, Godfrey to actually upload it um, to his website, Blender Diplom, or to Twitter. And a, a very interesting thing about particles and smoke sim and procedural patterns is that they can be combined together and visualized with the help of the point density shader uh, in Blender. What point density shader does is that it takes the input of, uh, say, particle system and it turns each particle into tiny volumetric point in space or voxel. So then you, you, you have access to the vector of this point density stuff and you can distort and bend it and it looks almost like volume, uh, volume displacement in that sense. Uh, here is the basics of how it works. First you run the smoke simulation. That one is controlled again with the turbulence force field. And then you throw in some particles and you make par particles follow the contours of the smoke simulation with the smoke flow field and then we visualize it as voxels using the point density shader, one of the default shaders of Blender. But it looks cool and detailed, surprise, only when combined with procedural noises. Because if you strip it down to its basic form, you will notice uh, that it's nothing more than a few floating points in space, a few voxels, uh, something like that, not very, Cool, I guess, not very spectacular. Let's get back our resolution. Zoom right into the cloud. You'll notice that it's pretty low res, but now we can distort the vector of this thing using procedural noises for something like that. Now it's much better. And we ended up creating a few spectacular puffs of smoke of interstellar gas using this technique. But still, uh, personally, I think that so far the most fruitful approach to the nebula creation in Blender was just good old procedural patterns. Now let me say a few words about Eevee. We still have about 15 minutes, I guess, so we can talk about Eevee. Eevee is a new real-time render engine capable of rendering volumes, among other things. Uh, I wasn't very excited about it, but then I saw this pillars of creation scene shared by Stefan Wink um, that amazed me like whoa now you can play with the real-time volumes right in your viewport once it was the holy grail of 3d rendering now we have it in Blender thanks to the um, uh, to the crowdfunding I guess and thanks to the innovation that is born within the community because of exchange of ideas and stuff like that. Here I prepared a few Eevee demos for you.
and here we should have some sound I guess okay thank you this is all rendered in practically in real time or I would say previewed in real time and for rendering it's like a slightly different picture but yeah you can say that it's much faster than cycles And what is great is that the blend files are available, you can find it on Twitter, just type B3D Nebula or something like that, or browse the Twitter history in my account because I shared all the files like Madman, especially if, when I saw something very cool, I immediately shared it. So that's deeply impressive, I think. That's Eevee. Uh, but we used Cycles because it's a good old path tracing engine is unbeatable in terms of detail in terms of what you can achieve how far you can crank up the render settings and stuff like that and to be able to actually render the demo reel uh, which i will show in a moment uh, we used we used render farms or and distributed rendering how many of you guys have used render farms by show of hands at least once in your lifetime wonderful how many of you haven't used render farms? Not a single one. All right, awesome. So yeah, the concept of distributed rendering is very simple. That's like render farm for free. Uh, distributed rendering means that people share their computers to do rendering tasks uh, that would otherwise take weeks and even months to render, presumably. Just like we do with crowdfunding by sharing our resources we share our computing power just like that and one of the most popular free render farms based on the distributed principle is ship it uh, to give you an impression what ship it is here is a typical render cluster which is I don't know a computer class that someone has set up like that and it can be anything it can, it can be your computer to give you some stats, since 2012, 100 million frames was rendered this way and ship it up to 700 machines simultaneously rendering each day thousands of years of planner project since 2012. And this is free render farm. Well, including our nebulae renders because we used it a lot for the demo reel that I will present in a moment and seven sequences that we end up rendering would take five months on 80s computer and three days on ship it. Uh, I'm not sure how, how much electricity we burned this way, but it was deeply satisfying to watch how people from all over the world connect to help us render this stuff out in just a few days. And that is incredible. Uh, but we also used commercial render farms for four or three renders, I guess. Uh, the pricing uh, was pretty, com com uh, pretty affordable, I would say, like 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 dollars per hour, per GPU hour. And that is possible because some of the render farms are also distributed. They work like Uber. They don't own the computers, they just, uh, just work like Uber. So you can rent some of their power and it would take 200 hours on 80s computer, four sequences, and one hour on commercial render farm at the cost of $140, which is not that bad. So by utilizing the distributed rendering provided by free render farms, but also a little bit of a push over the cliff with the commercial render farms, we were able to render uh, the demo reel for the Blender conference, and I will show it to you right now. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it because we worked with the Blender community. We collaborated with a, a bunch of people who were willing to participate in that stuff. Uh, we shared ideas, we shared blend files, and we reverse engineered the blend files of other members of the Blender community. That is an amazing process that is a joy to be a, to be a part of that open source movement. 
I'm very proud that I, I, I can work with these people. So here we go. Here's the demo reel of 3D Nebulae in Blender. I can play it once more. It was just a teaser, so here we go. We have no sound. Thank you very much. <laughs> and big thanks to all the people who have been helping us because we won't be able to, to, to do this alone, actually. Every idea is based on some other idea. And by collaborating, by sharing ideas, we are getting 100 million billion times more able to render anything you like, including awesome nebulae in 3D. My name is Gleb Alexandrov, and here is our jingle. With coffee and presentations in 3D. Started with a blimp, it's creative shrimp. Okay, thank you, thank you. I will be here for the entire day, so if you have any questions, just feel free to ask them. I will be happy, happy to share, uh, share my thoughts on it. Thank you so much. <laughs>